Hi, I'm George McLaris and this is a video to demonstrate Docker on RHEL 7. I'm here logged into the Red Hat customer portal. The resource management and Linux containers guide is a very useful piece of documentation and I can actually use this uh, excellent manual from Red Hat to uh, explain some concepts here before I start demonstrating things. Uh, Docker uh, is essentially a way to run Linux containers. What you have essentially is the Linux kernel and a number of technologies like that of namespaces, cgroups and SE Linux and of course a management interface that helps you make the Linux containers and uh, actually run something useful in them. Now namespaces is um, a technology that allows you to isolate in a way and abstract certain resources. For example, uh, there is a namespace for the process IDs. So each container has its own uh, slash proc file system. And in a way, the host, while the host operating system can actually see the uh, processes of the container, uh, the container can only see its own processes. But you also have, for example, ways to do the same for the file system. So you have, for example, the mount namespaces where uh, you can actually uh, mount certain parts of the host file system and uh, these appear to be unique in its container. You have IPC namespaces for inter-process communication and also network namespaces that provide isolation of the network controllers. In other words, bits that help you forward traffic to and from an individual container using, of course, the drivers and the hardware of the host system. Um, Docker, as I mentioned, is not the only way to run um, uh, Linux containers. You could actually run Linux containers uh, by using host containers and the virtual. That's right, the same tool that you actually use to uh, administer uh, virtual machines. So in this case you have a very strong dependency between the uh, uh, host operating system and the runtime stack of the container. In other words, each application that you run in a container here has a one-to-one -one dependency with the runtime environment of the uh, RHEL 7 host here. And that's good and bad. If you know that the applications are actually um, can actually run and they are 100% compatible with the environment of RHEL 7, um, then you have no problem. And in fact, the advantage of this approach is to uh, that that if you want to uh, instantly update with one command, uh, let's say 5,000 containers that theoretically or 6,000 containers that you could run theoretically on uh, um, a container host all you have to do is to actually issue a yum update on the container host operating system and this should actually update instantly all containers however if um, the uh, applications that you want to run have very specific runtime requirements you can actually separate the runtime dependencies for each application and make them a little bit independent of the uh, container host operating system and that's when you use image-based containers. Image-based containers is what I'm going to demonstrate in this video um, using the Docker technology. Um, essentially what you have is um, a platform image so if you're a developer for example what you could uh, a, a, an easy analogy you could think about is that of a source code repository whether it's git or svn or cvs so what you do is you pull a or check out depending on which uh, version control system you use a platform image this platform image of course contains the basics of the runtime environment on top of that platform image you have a number of layers that are read only and these layers actually add certain bits and components that are unnecessary for your applications to run all the way in the container writable layer. If you want to make further changes and add more runtime dependencies, you can of course add them on the writable layer and then commit them back to the Docker repository so that other people can uh, use 
the image with your own dependencies. And this is why one of the reasons why Docker is so useful. In essence, it's a very nice way to package your applications uh, in a very, very hassle-free and efficient, computationally efficient way. Okay, enough with the theory. Let's have a look at the uh, practice. So I'm sitting here on uh, a, a Red Hat 7 system. And uh, one of the th first things we need to do, of course, after having our system registered in uh, the Red Hat network, is to actually install Docker. And you can do that by actually issuing simply a yum-y install Docker. Um, if everything works OK, you should actually get the relevant packages, one package from the uh, yum repository. And at that point, you should actually have all that you need package-wise in order to start using Docker. Of course, uh, Docker at the moment has just been installed. Uh, it's not active. So if you issue a systemctl status Docker, we see that nothing is running there. So I'm going to make sure that I enable it. And I'm going to make sure that I start it and verify that it has started. And uh, yes, we see now that under the system slice, there is a, a Docker service that's actually running. That's good. Um, one of the first things you can do is to try and pull an image. And actually, you'll need to actually search for a particular image. Docker contains a public repository. So let's say that I'm, for example, that I'm looking to uh, to pull or obtain a Fedora image. So I'm going to do a Docker search Fedora. That might take a while. And as you can see here, uh, this will uh, command will actually uh, try to search, will search the public Docker repository and will actually give me all the relevant images, available images that I can actually obtain and use in locally in my Docker environment. Um, each image has a name, a description, which is basically what, what it does, a number of stars as it's actually voted by the users of the repository. And uh, essentially, you should also opt for trusted images, which means images that have actually been verified by the user community in terms of validity. In this particular case, let's say that I'm interested to run a container uh, on Fedora that has uh, that will actually serve an Apache web server. So I can actually do a Docker pull the image name Fedora slash Apache. If I do that, uh, you will notice that uh, the system will start pulling the platform image and all the dependent read only layer so it might take a while here depending on your network connection but anyway in this stage for example we are uh, actually pulling only 115 116 megs so it's much more efficient than actually trying to ftp or sftp a, a multi gigabyte virtual machine image which is the case in most uh, virtualized environments and uh, eventually, after pulling all the necessary layers, you should actually get back to uh, the command line prompt. OK, that has uh, actually finished. So now we verify, we can verify that we have an available image to work with by typing Docker images. And as we can see, we've just pulled about 450.6 megabytes of data on the uh, Fedora Apache, the latest image, which was created nine weeks ago. Another useful command that you can do is that of docker info at this stage. And uh, 
this is what you would normally do to see the uh, number of, of containers that you want, the number of available images or image layers, where your data file is, where your metadata files are, and all the other information, useful information that uh, uh, you might need to know about your Docker environment. So now we have obtained the image, what we can do is try and uh, make something out of that image and that is by making a container with docker run. So we can issue docker run. Um, you can actually, uh, if you are unsure, consult the manual page. So docker run essentially the uh, uh, image name that you want to um, use, uh, the command that you want to execute and some other parameters like for example the name of your container and etc etc here. Okay so let's try then to run the container so we're going to type docker run uh, I'm going to pass the minus i minus t tang t for tango arguments I'm going to give it the name called first con, first uh, container, and then I'm going to base it on an image name it's called Fedora Apache, the image we uh, just pulled on the previous step, and let's pass it the, the cell. If I do that, then immediately I get into a cell prompt and surprise surprise this shell prompt is not we are not in the container host anymore we are inside the container um, if we want to see what happens in the host we can I have another SSH session here on the host so we can type docker ps minus a for example and indeed we see that we have a container a unique container ID, the image with the tag, uh, so it's Fedora slash Apache latest, the command that we are actually running, which is an interactive shell at the moment, when it was created, when what's the status, what ports it uh, it abides to, and the name of the container. Another useful thing we can do to inspect the uh, state of the container is the Docker inspect. Uh, normally it's uh, enough to pass the container name so if we do docker inspect first con which is our container name and then pipe that to more then we get all sorts of useful info about the state and the various attributes of the running container like the host name which uh, is assigned by default by the docker it's a unique uh, host name um, various aspects of the environment, the command that we are running, the image name and then if we go further down um, of interest there are also some uh, networking settings here. The process ID of the uh, container running that's 30,359. Uh, going back to the networking information uh, obviously we use bridging here um, there is the docker zero bridge and that's its gateway and through that gateway interface the IP address of the container which is this one 172.17.0.4 uh, is actually able to communicate uh, with the outside world. Uh, host name path and host path notice that these are actually paths that map to the host, uh, uh, the container host. So varlib docker containers and varlib dot containers um, container identifier uh, hosts and host name are absolute paths in the host. So the host, the container host can see it, but, uh, but these are all mounted uh, in in an isolated way via the name spaces uh, code. So if you do an IF config you can also see the docker zero bridge which comes up automatically every time you start the um, the uh, uh, docker 
service. Okay, so let's exit from the container. Uh, we could actually remove the container by actually saying and, and stop it at the same time by actually doing docker space rm space container name. If we do that and then try to verify with docker ps we see that the container doesn't run anymore. So that was a very basic demonstration of how one can create a container, pull an image, create a container, uh, inspect the container and stop the container. Okay, but so far uh, the container just ran there. It didn't make anything useful. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to demonstrate how you can run a real workload with uh, a container and uh, how you can make that container available to the internet. And for that we're going to actually go back to the old command here. So we're gonna do something like this docker run minus i minus t the name of the container the image and the shell. But instead of stopping there uh, we also need to redirect the local port 80 of the uh, container where the web server is going to run um, to port 8080 on my um, container host. So this is what the minus p8080 uh, does here. And if we go ahead and execute that, we should be able to uh, actually get back to the container. Uh, this is, I am actually in the container namespace, so um, I'm going to make sure that I go under uh, the normal web server HTML uh, file directory. Um, there should be something like index.html there. And just to distinguish our uh, Apache web server running inside the container, I'm going to say this Apache runs inside our docker container. And I'm going to exit and then attempt to actually start the uh, in a rudimentary way the Apache web server. So let's see if the web server is running. Yes it is. And uh, the effect of this command is that if I now know the IP address of my um, uh, Apache, uh, the IP address of my container host, which is this particular one in an internal local area network here, 192.168.832, then I can map the Apache of the container running at port 8080, which I did, and if I click refresh now, then we see the Apache message and we know that we have a web server inside a container running in our container host file.